So I want to, for lecture two, I'm going to present these slides. Um, I'm going to um, save this then as a PowerPoint that you can all watch. But the video basically, I'm going to walk you through this PowerPoint as if I were, uh, we were in the physical classroom together and I was showing you these slides. Now, again, the way that I structure these is that obviously I've read this book some time ago, didn't take notes on it to an extent where I could have um, taught a course on it, and now I'm obviously teaching a course on it. So um, I'm rereading the text, taking notes as if I'm then trying to teach you about it, with some presumption that you are reading it yourself, maybe not as closely or maybe not as, um, um, obviously, with as much economics training as I have. So that's kind of what I'm adding to this. So this this these lecture slides are not a replacement to reading the material. I'm not trying to say that you could get away with not doing the reading at all and just watching these slides. Not at all. But watching these slides before you do the reading will give you a good overview of what's going to go on. I'll add some of my own commentary, and in this case, I'm going to add some uh, videos to it as well, which I think kind of highlight some of the points really well. And... Um, yeah, and that kind of wraps up the uh, discussion. So again, I'm going to post this as a PowerPoint, but let's start to um, look at this here. Okay. So <coughs> what we have here is um, a discussion of chapters five through eight of uh, the chapter, uh, the chapters five through eight of the book, The Manius Panics and Crashes book. And... Um, here's basically the overview. Um, in chapter five, we're trying to look at um, what are the trends, um, obviously I misspelled something here, um, but what are the trends domestically when a crisis develops and is it possible to stop a mania if you identify that it's there by giving some sort of official warning. Um, then in chapter six, we look at what happens to domestic spending and overall consumer sentiment when that mania is present. Then we look in chapter 7 at fraud and swindlers and mustache swirling kind of guys. And uh, then we uh, conclude it with chapter 8 where we're looking at the international dimensions um, of a mania. Okay, so I did more, when I was making this pr presentation, I made more slides about this than I thought I would, but I don't think it hurts. Um, what have we done? What did we do over the past two weeks? Basically, chapter one of the book gives you the kind of startling fact that, you know, if you think back to even to your own lifetime, you would think, wow, there really hasn't been a lot of severe economic problems going on. But in fact, since the 1970s, so I know that's before most of the lifetimes of, uh, before the lifetime of many of you in the class, but I was born in 1977. Um, I think of my life as having not had a lot of crises. So, um, you know, only until I was an economist and then obviously reminded by this in, in the textbook that um, there's actually been a, a great deal of crises since the 1970s. And we seem to be going from one crisis to the next. Um, and that each crisis is quickly followed by a credit bubble. And then that bubble implodes. Um Manias, which are kind of another level, manias are are larger, more dramatic, but they don't happen as often. Um, they're usually happening during the expansion phase of the business cycle. And then we have these periods of euphoria when um, everyone's just searching for these um, kinds of short-term gains. Um, and what happens in these euphorias is that something happens that leads to a pause. That pause gets everyone scared and it causes the asset that everyone was then buying for these short-term gains to become underwater. And really what you get from chapters one through four, one of the key ideas is that, and the whole point of the book, is that things history repeats itself. That um, there is a repeatable pattern that obviously... Um, the authors of the book identify for us that although each mania isn't identical to the other, there is a pattern. And again, what's happening here, step by step, is that there's an increase in the price of some sort of asset because of this euphoria that exists. 
as the asset is increasing in price, the wealth increases. Because your wealth increases, your spending increases because you're like, hey, I'm a richer person. Then at some point, that asset that was increasing in price reaches its top level. And then people are like, you know, it's never been as good as it is right now. And then something happens. Something happens that causes a pause, changes the psychology and the sentiment of people towards that asset, and then it begins to decline. And then the bubble bursts. So if we think of the housing crisis with respect to this, right, that um, the housing bubble starts with the dot-com bubble having burst in the early 2000s, late 1990s. So everyone gets out of internet stocks and says, I want to own a physical asset. I'm going to buy a house. And the government encourages people to buy the house. So everyone's buying houses. People are finding out that if they sold their house they just bought, that, it would, that um, the house value is going up. So then people are like, I'm going to spend more money because my house is becoming really, really valuable. People are getting home equity loans to borrow against that money so they can spend more and more and if you think back to 2004, 2005, everyone is thinking how great the economy is and how home prices have allowed people to become incredibly rich. And then something happens. The, um, you start to see this um, change in the economy in 2005 to 2007 where housing prices then begin to decline and the housing bubble bursts um, in 2008. All of that is connected to that description of just the housing bubble or this description in general is all linked to how much credit is out there. So what that means is that institutions like the Federal Reserve Bank play an incredibly important role in how much credit there is and the Federal Reserve Bank plays an incredibly important role because it does, it is the lender of last resort. In that chapter one through four, which again precedes what we just uh, read here, what we see is that um, um, in the Minsky model that the supply of credit is pro-cyclical, uh, meaning that um, uh, the the supply of credit is designed to get us out of bad economic times and keep us in good economic times. But that with this change in the supply of credit, it leads to individuals becoming over-optimistic about future prospects. And what happens is that eventually um, there's this um, displacement, this point where something happens that changes things. Um, and what's also important within this general discussion are expectations. Now, this is something where economists don't have a great deal of certainty about how expectations are formed. Generally, economists assume that humans, human beings are rational and that there'd be no reason why mania should occur. Yet, we obviously know that manias do occur and that crises do occur. Um... Because under rational expectations, you wouldn't have a mania because everyone is responding to changes in the overall macro economy instantly. And that obviously doesn't happen. Because what we instead see among many individuals is something called adaptive expectations, where people say, I have no idea what the future is going to be, so I'm just going to use the immediate past as a way to think about what I think the immediate future might be. Um, but what that means is that with these adaptive expectations, we could imagine that there are periods of time where people uh, make larger and larger gambles, not based on the past, but just their optimism of the future. What gets a mania really going, what gets a bad situation really going, it has to be fueled by something. There needs to be um, a fuel um, to this fire, and that is the credit. Um, now, most of the time, um, when you increase the credit, it doesn't mean you're going to be creating a mania. But what does tend to happen is that you do get a mania if you develop 
if you create all of this um, credit and you give it to a small set of borrowers, like in the case of um, the housing crisis, if we give it to um, individuals uh, that were called ninjas, uh, which sounds like a cool name, uh, but they were individuals that had no income, no jobs, no assets, and were buying a house because they did not were not required to verify that they actually had any assets or income. And it's not even that the central bank is creating this credit, this money out there. Rather, what happens is that there's new financial instruments that makes the credit available. If we look at the housing crisis, that's the whole point behind the movie The Big Short, where um, new financial instruments, meaning um, mortgage-backed securities, um, start to create more credit um, in the system. And again, the question is, is, what is the role of the Federal Reserve Bank in this? Can the Federal Reserve Bank, or any central bank for that matter, can it reduce um, how in unstable the credit levels can be? So that's what we read prior to um, chapters 5 through 8. Now we have chapters 5 through 8. So let's just look very briefly. Again, I'm not going, you should absolutely read the chapters. I just want to give you a broad overview of each of these chapters. Keep this lecture a little bit shorter so that you can kind of spend your time reading things and not letting me influence what your thoughts are going to be. Um, okay, so in chapter 5, what does the model of the crisis look like? Well, what we see is that there's a shock of some kind, negative or positive. You know, in this chapter, they talk about, like, a certain ship sinking or um, some technological development that triggers, some event triggers uh, an economic expansion. And this becomes a boom and then becomes a euphoria where the asset prices are developing rap increasing rapidly, then a pause, then distress, then panic and the bubble bursting. That first bullet point here is essentially the model of how a crisis occurs. If you're an economist and you look at that first bullet point, you would believe in rational expectations. So you should basically go from the first part of this to the last part of this instantaneously. We know that that doesn't happen. So we know that basically economists' assumption of rational expectations is not true. Really what we have to decide and what is discussed about a bit in Chapter 5 is whether the government should try to intervene to make these this economic expansion not so severe and the economic boom not so big. Um, one line that I thought was pretty important and significant and I think um, accurate was that, you know, and that when I say this I'm not trying to sound like I, I know – how the markets are going to work. But before the 2008 financial crisis, myself, as well as probably most other economists, would have been able to see that there was a problem, that there was going, that there was a bubble there. But there's no way to have determined who the firms were going to be that lost out so much from this. So, it's hard to say who the winners and losers are until the bubble really bursts. Um, and really during this time as well, you really have to think about what was going to be the role of Alan Greenspan during the dot-com bubble or Ben Bernanke as Federal Reserve Chairman during um, the, the housing bubble. What role did they have to say that a bubble existed? And would they have been able to deflate asset prices in a more controlled fashion by saying that there was a bubble? Eh, not necessarily. And all you might end up doing is just bringing on the bubble with now absolute certainty and uh, sooner than would have otherwise been. And that's what we really mean here. All bubbles, financial bubbles, do have to eventually pop. You just don't know how fast it's going to deflate. And usually if you try to deal with a bubble beforehand, it usually doesn't work out well. It actually does not work out well most of the time to try to intervene and make the bubble not deflate uncontrollably. Um, and that's because there's often a lag. Um, it is important to remember here, though, too, that crashes and panics are different. Um, and that a financial crisis may involve a crash, it may involve a panic, or it may involve both. 
And really what we're seeing here is that a crash is kind of the speed um, with which the assets uh, decline in price or in which an institution fails to exist. The panic is just something that kind of just happens like, doesn't even have a logic to it why um, you're starting to see this concern, this psychological um, shift um, within the economy and within individuals. Um, within chapter six, we have this general discussion of how do we see a euphoria? How do we see an economy that looks really odd? Uh, and there were some examples right at the beginning of the chapter where we talked about like tall, how many, how tall are certain buildings when they're being built? How many cultural centers are there? How many corporate jets out there? Um, and that usually this asset price bubble is strongly linked to people spending their money that they think that they have. And the most classic example of this that we see is the tulip mania, where um, as tulips were becoming more expensive, people spent that wealth. Then when tulips fell in value, that individuals spent less. Okay, so I want to just show this rather short video here. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm showing this in the right way. Trying to make, sh um, trying to find a way to. Okay, I can't. <clears throat> okay, so let's try it this way. Sorry, I'm trying to make the sound as big as I can, or as loud as I can. I want to show this first. I might say a few things and pause a few things here as I'm showing this to you. But the YouTube link as well will be in the thing. So if you want to fast forward the video a bit, but then you're going to lose that on my commentary uh, to the video, which maybe you're not even going to care about my commentary. Uh, but let me just do this kind of quick uh, overview of the, um, uh, of the uh, tulip bubble. goes, the prices of tulips skyrocketed here in the Netherlands in the 1600s and then crashed. It's seen as the first example of an economic bubble. So what are bubbles and what causes them to burst? Throughout the years, there have been all sorts of economic bubbles. Tulips, real estate, dot-com companies, maybe even Bitcoin. But they all have one thing in common. Investors pay more for an asset than may actually be justified, resulting in surging sky-high prices. Let's use tulip mania as an example to understand the anatomy of a bubble. Economists have laid out five stages of an economic bubble. Stage one, displacement. It's when investors start to get very excited about a new or innovative product or technology. That's okay, so right there, um, again, they're just referring to the book that you are reading. So again, it should highlight for you how important this book is that you are reading. This is, again, as I said in the very beginning of this course, the book that we are reading is the classic study of this phenomenon that is the title of this course, Economic Crises, Displacement. Something happens, some big change happens that alters the economy, thinks that we have a new driver of the economy. So this is the first event. Let me just Hit play what here in the Netherlands and go back product here. or start to get very excited about a new or innovative investor start stage one displacement it's when investors start to get very excited about a new or innovative product or technology that's what happened in the Netherlands in the 1600s the country was experiencing a surge in wealth thanks to booming international trade tulips were seen as luxury items they're rare and they take a long time to grow by the 1630s the Dutch had gone wild for tulips more and more buyers so the displacement here also as seen as another way would be 
there were traditional ways to hold wealth, right? Gold, silver, some other fancy um, metal. Tulips provided a way, an alternative new way to hold wealth. Drove up the prices of tulips fast. By some accounts, the price for a single rare type of tulip bulb was equivalent to $50,000. That brings us to the second stage of an economic bubble, a price boom. In so right, there's our second stage. Displacement leads to boom. In recent years, we've seen this happen with the dot-com bubble, when shares of the NASDAQ, which tracks tech stocks, spiked in the late 1990s. Or more recently, when the price of Bitcoin roughly tripled in just one month at the end of 2017. Price booms come back to the simple rules of economics. Let's say there's a limited supply. Oh, look at that. That's just... As an economist, that's fantastic work right there, right? These are what my dreams are made of. I have a product. If everybody wants a piece of it, there's a lot of demand. That causes prices to go up. There was only one tulip crop per year, so there was limited supply and a lot of demand. Because tulips can only be harvested during certain months of the year, the Dutch started buying tulips futures contracts. They're essentially putting a bet on the future price of a bulb that they didn't have in hand quite yet. Do you think that guy is just standing in the background there just to be on TV? Even though it was impossible for Dutch buyers to completely predict the future price of a tulip, they were confident they'd be able to sell it for a higher price than what they paid. This is the third stage of an economic bubble, euphoria. So displacement to boom to euphoria. It creates a trading frenzy as more and more buyers try to get in on the market. But then some investors begin to realize that the actual value of a product, like a tulip, isn't in line with what they paid, and so they cash out. This is called the profit-taking phase, or stage four. I mean, could a single tulip... So displacement, boom, right? Um, euphoria, and then profit-taking. Will the bulb really be worth $50,000? Buyers started to lose trust that they were worth that much. It so if you remember that like short little video, that commercial I showed you um, that on the Dutch tulip bubble, right? And there was like everyone kept bidding up and up and up the price of uh, the tulip bulbs. And then there was that guy, one guy like who's like, dude, it's a tulip bulb. Like, why would you pay that much money? That right there is what this uh, woman is talking about with her velvet pillow. Uh, with a tulip bulb on top of it. And so they started to sell. By 1637, the prices of tulips plummeted. Which brings us to the final stage of a bubble, panic. This is when everyone realizes how crazy it is that they had paid as much for a tulip bulb as, say, a house in Amsterdam. That's when they decide it's time to get out of the market. Selling, selling, and more selling ultimately causes a bubble to burst. We saw... So what that should do should highlight for you anyone who's investing in Bitcoin and then says, I'll be really smart about it. I will get out of it just when prices start to fall. Well, if there's a panic going on, there's no way you're going to get out um, without losing all your money because the panic does move quite quickly. A panic during the dot-com bubble. And I should say this too. And remember, to sell something, you have to have a buyer on the other side. So... Right? How many people were buying houses back in 2008? Not that many. And if everyone's trying to sell it, obviously there's going to be no market for that thing. As the Nasdaq tumbled around 40% in the second half of 2000, Bitcoin's plunge in early 2018 suggested that bubble had burst as the value of the cryptocurrency was roughly cut in half in just one month. One takeaway from tulip mania or other more recent bubbles is that prices are influenced by how much buyers are willing to pay. When a group of buyers gets really excited about a product like a tulip, they might not act rationally about its price. This can make predicting and preventing bubbles tough. Traders, economists, and central bankers all can get pretty obsessed with identifying the next bubble. After all, the burst of the housing bubble in 2008 contributed to the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. It's important to know that not all bubbles do burst. Sometimes price wings are just part... Uh, that's... Uh, that's not accurate. Um, maybe she misspoke or maybe she's intending to mean something other than what I think she means. Um, by definition... Bubbles do burst. All bubbles burst. But it might not have been a bubble in the first place. I think that's what she means. Um, by its very definition, a bubble is unrealistic. And by its very nature, it has to burst. Um, I, I think she means that not 
every incredibly high increase in asset prices is a bubble, I think is what she means. Supply and demand, and don't have spillover effects to other parts of the economy. Here in Amsterdam, tulip mania did have one lasting effect. The flowers are still a staple in the city nearly 400 years after the bubble. Hey everyone, Elizabeth here. Thanks so much for watching. Eh, well, I'm not as happy with her as a presenter of it, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, but I also think that gives, again, a pretty good overview here. Um, I'm trying to think here. I'm a, I'm a little bit... So the classic documentary about the tulip bubble, and again, we're, you might, again, why am I shouting, why are you talking about tulip bubbles for so long here? Um, it, it, I, the, the reason why is because, again, it gets us... It's, it's the first example of the crisis that's talked about in the book that we're reading here. Um, but again, you can see so many of the parallels throughout history, not only with our most recent example of the 2008 crisis, but even with other crises throughout. So let's start watching this. If this, um, again, the, the, there's the, the link is in the, um, will be in the presentation that I share with you. Um, but I'll, I'll show it on, on the video here so that you can, uh, if you just want to sit and watch this YouTube video for the whole lecture, you could just sit and watch it that way. But then if you want to fast forward it and you don't want my commentary, um, that's fine too. You can just kind of skip ahead in the video. So I'm going to start playing this. A collapse occurred. Obviously this is pretty long too, so... Um, but this is the classic, uh, one of the classic... Uh, videos about the tulip bubble and it's going to go into a lot more detail and is a great deal more accurate and has more I mean people who've devoted their entire career to understanding this acid bubble that existed uh, nearly right 400 years ago the first market bubble in recorded history the Chile menu is often said to be the first major stock market bubble that ever existed. What you're seeing here is people who have no real idea what a bubble is or that stock markets can go down as well as up. It would shake an entire nation. Well, one of the most striking characteristics of the development of the Dutch economy and Dutch society that grew out of that was the development of a very wealthy upper middle class who were based on, on trading. They were mer so this is important what he's saying here is that he is basically the reason why one of the reasons why um, the the uh, tulip mania is so important is that it, during this time period during the six, six, early 1600s the Netherlands was the most prosperous country um, in the world um, they were great at banking they were great at trade so they were the wealthiest. And so imagine the wealthiest country having this asset bubble that bursts, right? It'd be the equivalent of 2008 financial crisis where the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, has an asset bubble that bursts. Essentially. They were very important to the, to the whole story, I think. These were people who were making a living, but now with the trade that was taking place in that region, they suddenly had excess money. This again is a phenomenon which is fairly unique to the Netherlands. The Dutch merchant class was wealthier than, than equivalents in other countries. What happens when the bubble pops? The banking system gets involved and uh, finances a big boom like we had during the real estate boom recently. It could involve every person in the economy and every business in the economy as the entire banking system is brought to its knees. The extent of the mania and the extent of the sudden crash that took place at the end of it was particularly sharp and marked. It's uh, isolated to a particular region and to a particular product. It could be that a number of people make a lot of money during the boom and a number of people lose a lot of money during the bust. The Dutch, they call it the Dutch golden, golden age. And by the way, by uh, watching this video, you're getting your fill of classical music for the week or for the month. In order to understand the Dutch tulip mania, one must first understand the tulip. That leads to a stunning place. Well, the key thing to understand about the tulip is that it's not a European flower. It's actually an incomer. It was first found and grown um, in the mountains of Central Asia. 
in their native lands, Turkey, Kazakhstan, the Tibetan Himalayan area, they would grow wild on gravel scree, which is just loose gravel, not soil, not sand, but perfect drainage. The Turks became interested in the tulip, as far as we know, around about the 14th century, 15th century. Uh, we know that there were fashions for embroidering tulips on clothing, sometimes even the underwear worn by warriors, for example. They would have been a very small tulip, though. Uh, I guess people are wearing underwear made of uh, flowers. Blossoms would have been about the size of a dime to a nickel total, and only stood about two or three inches tall. Oh, they were quite small with just wispy little blooms. Um, then they were hybridized to have bigger blooms, but they were thought to be so exotic. And in a sense, the simplicity at that early stage was part of their appeal because they're seen as sort of symbolic of a number of things. Spring is the most obvious one, but also of passion. It came to Europe for the first time in the middle of the 16th century. And so the key to understand here is that it's a novelty. It's something that's new, it's unusual, it's very beautiful. And that really is the reason why there's such high demand for the tulip. It is the mid 16th century and the northern Dutch provinces are rebelling against Spain. Well, the tulip first came to the Netherlands in the early stages of the Dutch Revolt, which is an 80-year war for independence between the northern provinces of the Netherlands and Spain. You know, it, it's to do with things like excessive taxation. So a lot of uh, wealth was pouring into the Netherlands from other countries, and of course that wealth would become in the form of silver. They would coin that silver into uh, coins of the Netherlands, uh, Dutch coins, and so there was a lot of gold and silver flowing into that country. Would you rather have an economy with or without checking accounts? It just facilitates the trade. It's a way to ramp up the ease with which people make transactions. This okay, so listen to that right there, right? It's following the model of what we have here. Some new development in the financial industry that leads, that promotes the increase in, um, in the growth of credit that leads to, the credit's got to go somewhere and it's going to TULIP. So the Dutch were incredibly sophisticated at banking in this early point in time and they're developing these checking accounts and this ability to have an instant loan, use of your cash, and they're using that to buy um, these things. Spanish in the Americas have discovered vast new silver mines, both in Peru and in Mexico, and they're importing huge quantities of silver into Europe, which gives the European economy a gigantic boost, and it's crucial for the Dutch that this happens. It was. Um, and so what we're seeing right there is this idea that if you have in the Netherlands a gold or a silver-based currency, that you would imagine that finding more gold and more silver is going to lead you to um, a situation where you're going to have this uncontrolled, unexpected expansion in your um, credit line, in your amount of credit that exists. As uh, a country of ports, if you look at maps of the Netherlands, uh, they're literally surrounded by water. And, and so they were a great location in terms of that. The people there were very clever uh, and uh, loved to trade, loved to do business. It was a cultural thing for them. There's not a lot of direct Dutch contact with the areas where the tulip was grown in the 15th, 16th centuries, which is essentially the Ottoman Empire. There would be embassies, not just from the point of view of trade, but also from you know, the military point of view. And it's these, these missions that are based in Istanbul that first notice the tulip and become familiar with it. Despite the turmoil in Europe, a young French botanist was about to receive a package that would change Dutch history forever. His name was Carolus Clusius. Clusius was um, one of the best-known botanists um, in Europe at this time. He had a job as the, the head of the botanical garden at the University of Leiden, um, and one of the main things that he was active in was trading and acquiring different sorts of flowers, bulbs, seeds, and so on, uh, using his network of correspondence to search out novelties uh, and then propagating them in his gardens and then spreading around the, the, the new plants that he was growing as well. So he's really sitting at the centre of the development of the, uh, the very early stages of the tulip trade in Holland. Clusius's largest contribution to the tulip mania was his correspondence. Well, the European postal system in the 16th and 17th centuries was actually quite sophisticated. Um, it was possible to 
uh, send via a sort of courier system, essentially, which would be on horseback, you know, quite significant packages, uh, very securely through relatively good roads at an affordable price. The importance of the, the network that Cluj specifically has, of course, is that it has you know, heavy links to the wealthiest classes of Europe. So, you know, humanist intellectuals tend to have patrons, for example, they're the people who are funding all of this academic research. You end up with this becoming something which is known to a very high-ranking group of very wealthy people in Northern Europe. It's very easy to get distracted by the flowers. It never was about the flowers. Um, this was about the bulb as an investment good. There you go. Listen to that right there. That was an important line. It was not about the flowers and how pretty they were or whatever the flowers were. It was this transformation in individuals considering something that used to just be a pretty thing you would give to um, right, someone you like or a pretty thing that you would plant in your backyard to being an asset. Think of that. That's just like a house being something you live in to being an asset that not only retains its value over time, but um, grows in value over time, right? If we asked our grandparents, like, what they thought of a house, they would just think, well, it just means I don't have to get kicked out by my landlord. I own my own thing, and my family can always live in that thing. They didn't think of it as, I'll buy it now and then resell and then sell it to someone else five years down the road or ten years down the road, or that I'll buy it uh, buy a condo and then rent it out to others through Airbnb. That's a shift, a shift which is part of the asset bubble. The bulb is a storage unit that has the roots and the potential of the stem and flower. If Dude, Sarah, I couldn't agree more. If you take a tulip bulb and slice it right down the middle, you can see with a microscope that tiny little flower all folded up like an origami project in the middle of the bulb. The tulip bulb is kind of shaped like a drop of rain wide at the base and has a point to it. The offset is when the stalk starts to grow off the bottom or out of the side compared to straight up the center through the point. The, the reason that they were valuable is because to produce more tulips from seeds takes about seven to ten years. If you plant the bulbs, the bulbs will produce offshoots of two or three and then you could double your amount of bulbs every two or three years. This was not, not like any other crop. The tulip bulb is a investment good that produces additional tulips. A flower will only be in bloom for you know a matter of a few days or weeks and the bulb is permanent it continues to exist after the flower has, has faded away for the year the bulb makes the commodity something which is tradable and that's its importance they became infected with a virus which is called the tobacco mosaic virus this is what causes them to break out in particularly vivid and, and bright colors and stripes and flares of color in the ways that we see in paintings of the tulips of the tulip mania once it was infected with that virus you weren't going to get many blooms or many offsets. Upon appointment by Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II in 1573, Clusius's tulip gardens across the provinces would begin to face theft in his absence. The people who had the tulips initially were the rich people and the botanists, the root cutters um, who traveled around, the, these were kind of low lives at the time, but who traveled around uh, and would... Oh, dude, you see that guy? He looked pretty sneaky. Not that guy. Who traveled around, the, these were kind of... Tulip gardens across the province. Around, the, these were... Uh, yeah, that guy. Uh, okay. And would uh, steal flowers out of the garden, oh, uh, low lives at the time. Oh, but, that guy looks mean. Ho, ho, ho. Who traveled around uh, and would uh, steal flowers out of the gardens of some of the wealthy. And, uh, and in fact, it was the root cutters who made it possible for the tulips to spread across the provinces. With his stolen tulips now being sold to a variety of buyers, Clusius's misfortune had set in motion a series of events that would culminate in the Dutch tulip mania. You can have a situation where there might be only 10 or 20 examples of the, this particular variety of tulip in existence, and that makes them you know, vastly, vastly um, in demand and you know, potentially worth a vast amount of money. Not even the keenest of Dutch businessmen, whatever tulip fanatics though they were, could have guessed what was to come. Well, the interesting thing about the way in which the tulip was first grown in the Netherlands 
by members of the regional class is this really is very much you know a hobby what you can see is that when these you know these early trades the very small number that do occur the news of that starts to get out that's where you know, the, the avarice begins to come in the middle class at that time would have been people like weavers and shop owners uh, these were people who were making a living but now with the trade that was taking place in that region they suddenly had excess money. Essentially, the Dutch had what we might call the first modern economy. Um, they were trading extensively with the Far East, what was known as the rich trades, the trade in spices. So they were bringing vast amounts of money relative to other uh, nations. Initially, uh, many of the middle class had excess money. They were taking this excess money and putting it to work in these tulips. But as the mania started to evolve and they saw opportunities to make more money, they started uh, borrowing against their assets. So some of these middle class were literally borrowing money from others against their looms. With Spanish pressure mounting on the southern provinces, the north would see a massive influx of artisans beginning in the 1590s. Without modern exchanges, tulip bulb traders would do business in the smoky back rooms of local taverns. They would come to be known as colleges. Essentially, it was a trade that took place amongst lower class people uh, who headquartered themselves in taverns and in inns. These people would gather in the pubs, their local pubs. Uh, they would get their alcohol. And they... So this is kind of important discussion because they're basically then talking about what is the, um, the information patterns. What's the quality of the information that everyone is sharing with each other? Be some food and they would start drinking and then the trading would begin. And, um, and so uh, the trading would begin with the simplest, most boring of the bulbs usually. And uh, these would be sort of the lowest cost and they would start their Dutch auction and uh, sort of establish the price for the day. And then they would move to the more valuable bulbs and from, from that point on for the evening. Colleges were not sophisticated uh, trading arenas. There were no uh, margin requirements. The middle class, in Holland at that point in time was experiencing rapid growth in income, probably unlike they'd ever experienced before. They were getting a taste of the good life. You can imagine that they looked to the upper classes and saw that the way, the way that they lived uh, would want to be able to have some of the things that they had. The Dutch are, even today, uh, people who love to trade, who love to do business, and uh, are very creative financially. So uh, this brought that class of people into a new world that, that they, were, I think, were really enjoying and were excited to be a part of. They would typically be you know, well known to each other. They'd be um, you know, fellow townspeople. They would possibly be involved in similar trades. Um, a number of people um, who became involved in the tulip trade were artisans, essentially, who had sold or mortgaged the tools of their trade to, do, to acquire some capital to get involved. The weavers in the... the pamphlets that we have from that time are very closely associated with the tulip trade and a large number of weavers seem to have sold or mortgaged their looms. By the mid-1630s, artisans would be giving up their tools in order to participate in the mania of tulip bulb trading. To be invited to have a seat in the stock market, it's, that's something which is completely out of the reach of a typical Dutch tulip trader. These are low-class artisans. They are looking at a financial mechanism they have no hope of ever accessing. They're aping its mechanisms and they're aping its, the way in which it works with something they can in fact lay their hands on. So the tulip is really something which is, is not traded at all on the Dutch stock market but comes centre to a completely different sort of mirror trade effectively um, in the period of the tulip mania. The impression that I get is that the tulip, we're talking about a period now where the tulip has been in the Netherlands for 20 or 30 years. The number of tulips therefore available within the Netherlands has gone up fairly substantially. The number of different varieties that have been propagated and grown has exponentially increased. So here, right, we've got a discussion then of basically that the acid itself starts to proliferate, right, become much more complicated, take on different variations. Just like houses, then our condos, land, all those other sorts of assets. There is good money to be made in the tulip trade. Uh, there's a story, I believe, about a house being purchased for three of these bulbs. Uh, and I've been to the Netherlands and seen that house. It's quite a mansion. However, as the mania begins to boil, the traders start to get overzealous. Where, you know, one or two of these, these most beautiful but rarest... 
saying right there, you, the euphoria is going to start to lead to the uh, pause in the increase in the asset prices, which then causes the uh, rapid decline of the Parts asset price. Are sold for you know sums that are expressed at the time as you know three times the price of the most valuable house in Amsterdam, for example. The bulbs would have been traded during the summer and in the early fall. But uh, so if you, if you had gone into the market, you would have seen boxes with boxes with bulbs in them and people would buy and sell those bulbs. But by mid to late November, the bulbs in, in Holland and the bulbs all over Europe would have been planted, which limited the trading to uh, the summer months. And once the uh, once the financial innovation of the futures contracts was introduced, then... Oh, man, did you hear that? The futures contract? If you read in the book and you're reading this chapter quite closely, you'll remember that the thing that limited the tulip, as, a, as, as, as these guys are talking here, the thing that limited the tulip market was a very small planting season and the, long, and the length of time it took to grow it. The financial innovation was that people didn't actually have to possess the bulb. They could say, I planted this bulb, it's going to grow nine months later, and I will trade you something based on this bulb. A bulb that you don't know what kind of tulip, how big it's going to be, if the tulip's going to die. So you're taking on a risk now that you previously were not taking on. That futures contract is another part of the financial innovations that are causing this bubble. The equivalent... Um, in the U.S. housing market would be obviously things like um, um, mortgages to um, individuals that have a variable rate of interest and assets uh, and mortgages that don't require any disclosure of assets or income, a no-doc uh, mortgage. They could trade them throughout the winter months when the bulbs were underground. What actually is happening is that the bulbs are still in the ground. They're being cultivated by specialist gardeners. Um, and what's being traded is actually a promissory note that says, I own this bulb in this garden, in this location. I'm transferring that ownership to you. And you're ending up with, with promissory notes that have a whole series of these transactions scrawled on them in the colleges. And the, the, the bulb is traded from one person to another person. The liability that goes with it to actually settle the bill on the promissory note and pay for the, the bulb when it's finally flowering is also transferred. A promissory note is the same as it is today. It was basically a promise to pay. Uh, somebody who, in this case, you knew, somebody in your community almost for sure, would uh, go to sell you uh, the futures for these aces. And uh, you wanted to buy them, but you didn't have enough money today. And you didn't want to give all the money because they haven't delivered the bulbs. So the idea was, I'll pr I promise to pay you come May, but you're going to deliver these bulbs. And in exchange for that, I'm going to give you, I don't know, maybe 10% down or 5% down. Um, and then when you deliver the bulb, I'll pay the balance. Many of these people never intended to pay the balance. They intended to buy the note, hold it for a few weeks, and then sell it in one of the colleges. There you go, right there, right? Uh, this is just like in the 2008 financial crisis of individuals buying a house with no intention of owning it for the long run and people even buying someone else's mortgage, not holding it over the long run and then selling the mortgage to the government or um, selling um, the house before they uh, actually even move into it or only after doing some minor renovations and make a profit. And the pieces of paper, these promissory notes, became a form of money. At the onset of the winter of 1636, individual promissory notes were changing hands almost 10 times a day. However, this particular winter would lead to the eventual decline of the tulip bulb market in the United Provinces. Doctors Thomas and McClure from Ball State University recently presented a paper on the tulip mania. They refer to the bulbs as sequestered capital. The Austrian theory has a thing called the structure of capital in it. And across this structure of capital, uh, the prices coordinate the production process by which you get from a beginning thing to an ending thing. But the, the problem with the theory is that uh, the missing piece, it's sort of a almost a Bermuda triangle in their theory, 
uh, is this missing piece. There's this signalless component, and that's uh, when capital is sequestered. If we look at the structure of capital and how capital is invested, from the very, very earliest stages, it would be research and development. And at the research and development stage, everything is secret. Keep it quiet. We don't want anybody to know what we're doing. When the product is sufficiently completed that you're ready to deliver it onto the market, it emerges out of that time period and becomes visible. And at that point in time, now your competitors see what you're doing. You see how who else is in the market. You have signals from the buyers as to how much it's going to be worth. And uh, very quickly, the market will adjust. And people will adjust how much they're going to produce and at what prices. In order to understand the idea of sequestered capital, you must first understand the life cycle of a tulip. Depending on the variety of the bulb, it will start to send up a shoot in early December from the bulb, but not break the top of the soil. The breaking of the soil will come usually in March or April, and then it will bloom in late April or May. From there, it'll bloom probably about a week to week and a half per variety and it'll start to die off, which will start your cycle all over again. But during that earliest stage, when capital is sequestered and it's hidden, we don't have those signals. Now, what happens is that there's one signal coming in, which is coming from the consumer saying, we want to buy these, right? And everybody in there is getting that same signal, but they don't know what the other ones are doing. Okay, this would be like the farmers. I know there's a demand for tulips. I'm going to grow a lot of tulips. I'm going to put a lot of tulips in the ground. In fact, I'm going to put every tulip I can get my hand on in the ground. But you're not going to have the ability to go around and count how many tulips your neighbors have planted or the people in the nearby town have planted. So you don't know the magnitude of tulip bulbs that are in the ground. That's pretty important there too, right? So one of the, the critical features of this is that you need to have some way to restrict the information so that individuals don't have any idea about how much supply exists so that no one can kind of predict that there is a or that people would notice that there is a bubble there. Um, this kind of gets you uh, by hiding it right and things being underground you have no way to know it. And by the way again it's a lot of classical music here so we are certainly getting our fill. And when those bulbs all came up pretty much at the same time in February now the signal's there. There we go. Right there, right? So then everything pops out of the ground in February, and now we're like, you know, shit, there's a lot of tulips that have just blossomed. <laughs> um, we did not expect that. Um, uh, the equivalent would be is that in 2007, lots of homes and condos and single private homes are being built. And you're not building homes, at least not in the south and in Hawaii, you don't build homes in the winter. And then in the spring and the summer, all of a sudden, all this inventory is out there. And that is what caused the collapse. With winter trading of contracts in full swing, hundreds of florists and bulb growers continue to do business, totally unaware of the rude awakening on the horizon. It's the first Tuesday of February, 1637. The members of Harlem's college have just begun the day's auctions, but no one is placing any bids. And those people, as those sprouts came up, they would have realized, they would have been, they would have come to the realization that there were more sprouts than they had ever seen before. You couldn't help but look out and see the, the crops that would be growing at that point in time. And of course, the fields would be empty, except for some snow and dirt until that first week of February, when suddenly you would see, as far as your eye could see, tulips emerging. And it was in Harlem then that, uh, in, on I believe the 5th of February, that the first big collapse occurred. Uh, they bought the first batch of bulbs up for sale, started at a pretty high price, as they usually did, and they had no takers. And then the Dutch auction started to reduce the price. It kept going down, and nobody would buy it at any price. And that's so that's an important kind of thing to understand here, too. This is what is known as a Dutch auction. In a typical auction, as you may know, the price keeps getting bid up and up and up until there's only one person remaining. In a Dutch auction or a reverse auction, you start at a high price, and you keep going down and down and down until someone says they will take that price. And basically, they're describing the fact that 
um, in this market, they started out with a high price that they thought they were going to get, and then it keeps going down and down and down and down and down and down. Signal then among those people was we have a problem. You know, we know that the collapse happened very quickly within individual towns, which certainly suggests an element of panic and the transmission of that news fairly rapidly. The prices were not going to be sustain, uh, sustainable in the market. They, they would have come to that realization pretty quickly. We have to bear in mind that these are guys who've been involved in the trade for, you know, maybe not a very long time, but even if you've only been involved for a few weeks or months, you've had time to involve yourself in multiple auctions, multiple exchanges. You hold some promissory notes on tulips, which you had been holding on to on the assumption that the price would continue to go up and you're going to make a profit on it. If the price starts to go down, then you are suddenly you know, very highly liable for large sums of money that you simply don't have. Without modern communication technologies, it would take the rest of the United Provinces a few days to learn of what happened in Harlem. Most of these would probably be due the 1st of May, when the bulbs would be taken out of the ground, um, and they would be able to then sell what they had. But at this point in time, with the market collapsed, uh, people were panicked. People were concerned because they knew they weren't going to be able to pay the balance and that what they were going to get wasn't worth what they were paying. By the second week of February, there were... And that's really the losers here, right? The losers then are the holders of the promissory note that are now going to finally, that promissory note is going to be paying out in this one auction where all the prices are falling then dramatically. Uh, no more college... Uh, colleges trading these contracts the market just vanished these people would have been looking for a way out as soon as you introduce the possibility that prices might go down that you might end up liable for some of these large sums of money the trust can evaporate very quickly the collapse is something which is very highly dramatic much much more so than for example the wall street crash of 1929 we're talking about a, the difference between the value of a commodity going down by two-thirds over two years in the case of wall street to the value of a commodity going down by 99 percent in two weeks with all the previous season's contracts due soon, florists don't have the money to pay for their orders. The connoisseurs at the top end have multiple resources. The tulip investments they have are a very small proportion of their total worth. They are unaffected by this trade and they are unaffected by the crash. Everybody else is. There are two other classes who are involved. The growers are professional gardeners who are essentially keepers of these assets. They're the people who physically control them um, and are expecting to get paid for their work in guarding and protecting and growing the tulips by the people who own them at the time that the flowers, the bulbs are lifted out of the ground. The other people who are involved are the traders themselves who typically don't know how to grow a tulip and probably have never seen, in fact, many of the tulips that they own in any state at all, even as bulbs. And they are um, liable to pay the growers for their work and they are also liable to pay each other uh, for the various promissory notes they hold. So right, and there's the problem. Now there's not enough money for these promissory notes to pay out. There were no margin requirements. And again, I think it's because of the newness of this financial instrument in the case of this commodity. Your sole way of actually acquiring that money is by calling in the debts that are owed to you by other tulip traders on other promissory notes. And you see these guys panicking, running, heading for the hills at the same time. So there is a sort of double catastrophe happening to your worth at that same time. You, your own worth is going down. Your ability to call in value from other people is evaporating almost you know, within your sight. Well, you know, the collapse of the Dutch tulip trade is perhaps the, the element of the bubble which is least characteristic of what we now see today. The Dutch did have a very highly developed court system. You could, in theory, enforce contracts through that system, but the people involved in the tulip trade were not the sort of people who would be involved in court cases normally in Holland. Yeah, you, you'd have to have some kind of compensation for the, the people who had done the planting and the cultivating. The balance essentially between the money that an individual trader owed to somebody else, the money that was owed to him, was probably in many cases relatively close. And so the amount of catastrophe that came out of this was actually considerably less. In the blink of an eye, what was indeed a huge fortune on paper had bloomed into a disaster. In the winter months of 1636 to 1637, the price of tulip bulbs had surely increased tenfold and subsequently decreased tenfold. Tulip mania was over. 
The most obvious long-term effect was actually on the popularity of the tulip as a flower in the Netherlands. It acquired a, a pretty unsavoury reputation. Again, you could see a, a significant religious and moral dimension to this because the sin of, of greed was, was clearly exemplified in the tulip mania. And so the idea of trading and buying and selling and growing even tulips became very unfashionable in the Netherlands for quite a considerable time. The connoisseurs, having never been in it for profit, continued to trade revered bulbs for another hundred years. We know very little about what the connoisseurs thought about the tulip trade. One might imagine they would find it quite vulgar, but we don't know that for sure. Um, what we certainly can say is that the people who became involved in the tulip trade are pure traders. You know, they want to actually, you know, acquire wealth, not tulips. They had no use for tulip bulbs in the way that the connoisseurs did as something which has value in terms of its beauty. They very typically wouldn't have a garden to grow it in. At the very top end of the trade with the connoisseurs, this trade seems to go on more or less, you know, as it had done before. Traders would have a harder time adjusting to a post-mania United Provinces. Their, their dreams of, of wealth were probably evaporated. Effectively, it would appear pretty much just goes back to their original trade. Now, this isn't that easy because you've you've mortgaged or sold your goods you've got to acquire the money to reacquire or at least loan the tools of a, some other trade one of the main myths about the dutch tulip mania was that it was intimately connected to the dutch economy as a whole and that the crash of the tulip bubble caused a major economic depression in, in the netherlands the research that i've done shows that, that wasn't the case that the tulip bubble was actually completely separate essentially to the mainstream of the dutch economy Ultimate mania has been studied. So that's actually a, a pretty important statement there. So this is kind of the equivalent of people saying um, that the housing crisis wasn't that significant because housing is such a small part of the overall economy. Yes, that's true, but it really screws up the credit market, which is also the case here in the tulip bubble. But, and there's a lot of information about it considering how long ago that it was. It all took place in one little area in just uh, about six months uh, time period. And um, it had all the elements that we were looking for. It had uh, economic growth, a high period of economic growth. It had the involvement of the middle class. It had financial innovations. And, uh, and it had a very colorful and exciting product that people were focused on. Anything that comes up with so much beauty. I think that the tulip is the Dutch icon along with windmills and wooden shoes. In a flash, it was there and it was gone. Analyzed for centuries, the tulip mania remains one of the oldest examples of a market bubble. From historians to economists alike, all affirm its depth and zeal. Despite its age, this is a story that will not soon be forgotten. Okay, so, um, a lot of that, what you've just seen there, is really kind of our description of chapter six. If you want to read that part about it, but you get a lot of detail in that. If you just watched the video up to now and you kind of took a few notes or even just know that this video exists, you wouldn't even necessarily even have to read that part of the, uh, of the book. Now, following that here, then in Chapter 7, we start to talk about what typically gets revealed to us during a, uh, a financial crisis are uh, frauds, that frauds emerge. Um, during this time. Um, and the famous example of this is uh, Ponzi, Charlie Ponzi. And basically he bought these deposits. He offered 45% returns to people who bought these deposits that were from banks when other banks were offering theirs, selling their deposits for only 2 to 3%. So then everyone bought the deposits from Ponzi. But after 18 months, he couldn't pay out that 45% rate anymore. Not as significant because it really only lasted 18 months. The Bernie Madoff example lasted much longer. Um, we will watch a longer uh, video movie about Madoff um, <coughs> later because um, the, the Bernie Madoff scandal basically emerges in December of 2008 after the bubble starts to burst for the US, U.S. housing market. But the fraud that is in this bubble that has burst is only one example along with others. 
Um, Enron, Bering Brothers, the U.S. Savings and Loan Disaster of the 1980s, Tyco Worldcom. These are all other kinds of frauds and swindles that emerge. Now, I wanted to pick one of these that you that many of you might not be aware of, that you've heard of the company, but you might not be aware of just because of the age of most of you in this class. Um, and that would be the Enron example, which really emerged um, when the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s. So I know we're kind of watching... Um, a lot of movies here and I'm trying to kind of attach a, a relevant short movie to each of these chapters. Again, with the idea that you have an idea of what's going on in the chapter, I've kind of talked about it a little bit. You're going to read the chapter kind of quickly maybe or more extensively and take some notes and then there'll be a movie where I provide some commentary that kind of highlights what's going on and applies what's in the chapter. Most of us are familiar with the infamous Enron scandal. And here's what I'm guessing most people know about it. The company cooked the books and pulled off some shady accounting tricks. They were caught and now cease to exist as a result. But this is a very thin understanding of the subject. There was so much stuff that went down, I can't even do it justice in a short video like this. Yeah, well, I'm gonna let him do it because I wanted a short video and this is reasonably good. If you want to become an expert on it, there's a movie I can recommend. It's a really good movie. This is a good movie. Smartest Guys in the Room. Um, I don't want to show the whole thing, uh, but it is a really good uh, movie. It's called Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. It's nearly two hours about the scandal, and honestly, I think that's even rushing it. The entire ordeal is so complicated that there can easily be an entire college course centered around it. And that course would be... Dude, what's going on there? Uh, that's not even an econ class that would look to be... Jeez. Uh, Looks like dynamics of some kind. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else to really say about this? For the advanced students. Wouldn't it be great if someone created a YouTube video that concisely explained it in a way that's both entertaining and easy to understand? Enron formed through a merger in 1985 between two energy companies. That's what Enron was, by the way, an energy company. When I say that, it's a huge simplification because Enron was involved in so many things in complex ways that the average person didn't even come close to understanding exactly what the company did. It was founded by a man named Ken Lay. You may want to remember that name. Now let's fast forward around to the year 2000. It was a fantastic company and very attractive for investors. Okay, so right, you're starting to see again this idea that you reach that point in the euphoria of the dot-com bubble where everyone thinks that everything is going to be great forever. Enron is one of those companies where everyone thinks that everything is going to be great forever. At the time, they were thought of as being one of the world's leaders in business. I would say it's like how we view companies like Apple and Google today, but that's not even close to how amazing Enron was. They were making money and growing at a rate that no one had ever seen before. So here, I'll pretend to be a financial advisor helping you decide which stock you may want to buy. Here we go. I've looked over all the numbers and I strongly advise you to invest in Enron. They're one of the fastest growing and most respected companies around today. I'll just show you a few numbers to support my advice. As a financial advisor, I look at companies' revenue, debt, and past stock trends. Here's Enron's revenue over the past five years. Just look at that growth. It's quicker than I've ever seen. I also checked out their debt, and it's very reasonable compared to their equity, meaning they're in great standing with creditors and have very little chance of going bankrupt. And as far as stock trends, here's a graph showing the stock price over the past few years. Just three years ago, they were in the $20 range. Today, it's well above 80. I've been advised... I mean, that's pretty significant, right? Um, um, as a share price, uh, again, this is during the dot-com bubble. So, you know, it's going up just like all the other dot-coms are going up. But there seems to be a real business behind it because it is an energy company. It's well above 80. 
I've been advising clients to purchase this for some time now, and I've yet to have someone disappointed by their decision, except one guy who decided against it, and he's kicking himself right now. Plus, while I was reviewing their year 2000 annual report, it was filled with statements straight from Enron themselves saying how they're expecting future. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Laser focused. Um. Yeah, but again, a lot of these statements that you're seeing here are obviously um, quite um, uh, broad um, and overly generous about the abilities of Enron to deliver on these things. Future growth and success in the future. So Enron is well respected, has incredible revenue growth, low debt, and a solid history of unheard stock growth. So what do you think? Do you want to invest in Enron? Okay, I'm done being the advisor right now. Since I couldn't hear your answer, I'll assume you said yes. You want to invest in Enron. And if you said no, that's a foolish answer at the time. Based on the information available, practically anyone who knew anything about the stock market would say to jump on it. So now you've invested heavily in Enron. Now let's fast forward one year and see how you did. Oh, so it turns yeah. out the stock didn't go up like everyone had projected. In fact, it's gone down just a tad. What was in the $80 range when you invested is now in the 50 to 60 cent range. So you've effectively lost all your money. I'm making light of it here, but there were thousands of people that experienced this, including the Enron employees. They invested heavily in 401ks and retirement plans that were tied up in Enron stock. And really so that was one change after this event happened. Um... The federal government, which controls 401k regulations, made it um, next to impossible for a company to offer employees stock in the company that they work for. And obviously, it's not a good idea to buy stock in the company that you work for because if the company fails, you lose your job and you lose your investment. Really, can you blame them? But Enron went bankrupt in December of 2001. Thousands of people lost their jobs, retirement funds, and any other money they had invested in Enron. So what happened between this year and the last? As it turns out, all these numbers I just showed you were just an illusion. Back when I was your financial advisor, I was advising you based on false numbers. Take the revenue I just showed you. It's all fake. How so? Here's what Enron did to make it appear so high. It's thanks to something. I mean, so if you look at these numbers, I mean, it should be pretty obvious that it, I don't know how you make revenue grow by uh, a factor of nine in four years between 1996 and the year 2000, or even how you get it to increase by 50% between 1997 and 1998, or 33% uh, between 1998 and 1999, or more than double between 1999 and 2000. Called mark to market accounting. Its effect is basically being able to recognize revenue when you have no revenue. Here's an example of something that actually happened with Enron. In 2000, they signed a 20 year contract with Blockbuster. Enron thought the contract would result in profits in excess of $100 million. So only three more years and the contract between Enron and Blockbuster will be expired. Well, obviously the contract didn't work out and was actually doomed from the start. It had to do with bandwidth and internet streaming, but the technology didn't work and Blockbuster ended the contract. Here's the problem. Enron recognized over 100 million in revenue from the deal. It doesn't quite seem like they earned 100 million in revenue from the deal. Yet they reported 100 million in revenue from the deal. Then, as an advisor, I looked at that number to tell you that you should buy Enron. And they did this far more than just the Blockbuster contract. All they had to do was project some earnings, and boom, they had earnings. It essentially allowed them to put any number they wanted in that earnings column. Another thing I looked at when advising to buy the stock was their liabilities. Well, as you may have guessed, their liabilities were completely false as well. How they pulled this one off is a little more complicated. But in short, they set up side companies and pushed the debt over to them. So all of a sudden, Enron's debt problem was solved. Obviously, they still had the debt, but it was no longer on their financial reports, and therefore non-existent as far as investors can tell.
Right, so basically it pushed all the debt to spin-off companies that they created and then the revenue seemed inflated because they did mark-to-market accounting. I also looked at the stock trends. These high stock prices were a result of investors being fooled by these numbers for an extended period of time. So the stock was trading for over $80 per share, whereas if the company hadn't pulled these accounting tricks, it would have been trading for a fraction of that. There were numerous other accounting frauds committed, but these were the biggest and most impactful. But there's another part to this. What about the auditors? The job of an auditor is to look over all these financial statements to ensure the company's position is fairly represented. Every public company legally has to have their financial statements audited. The primary purpose of an auditor is to prevent things like this from happening, so the investors can confidently use the reports to make informative decisions. Had the auditors done their job properly, they would have seen red flags all over the place. But they weren't doing their job properly. They weren't really doing it at all. They were being paid by Enron to look the other way. The name of these auditors? Arthur Anderson. So that's also one thing that's mentioned in this chapter is that this firm doesn't exist anymore, but it was one, there used to be uh, the big five accounting firms. Today there are only four. The one that does not exist anymore is this Arthur Anderson company. Arthur Anderson was both an accountant for the firms, but they made most of their money by uh, consulting for the firms that they served as an, uh, as an accountant for. So they would basically say, we don't want to lose the lucrative co- um, um, consulting contract with Enron, so we will give them the accounting advice that they need to be able to do what they do so that we don't lose this lucrative uh, consulting contract. And obviously, Arthur Anderson was a trusted name that investors trusted. So they trusted that Arthur Anderson was properly auditing Enron. And then when it was determined that they were not, Arthur Anderson was held legally responsible for the collapse of the Enron Corporation. And Arthur Anderson was actually owned by the partners of the firm, meaning the accountants and the employees of the firm. At the time, there were five major accounting firms. Ah, jeez, the guy is repeating me. PwC, Ernst & Young, and Arthur Anderson. Almost all major companies would use one of these accounting firms to audit their financial statements. Now it's down to four major accounting firms because Arthur Anderson didn't survive the scandal. See, an auditor survives by their reputation. When investors see that PwC audited a set of statements, they trust that they're accurate. But now, if Arthur Anderson audits something, the investors are still questioning whether or not it's accurate, which makes investors avoid the company. So all of Arthur Anderson's customers switched over to one of the other four firms. The auditors didn't do their job in detecting it. But who's responsible for the fraud on Enron's end? Two executives from the company are pretty heavily blamed. Ken Lay, who I mentioned earlier, and Jeff Skilling. They were both found guilty of conspiracy and fraud, among other things. Skilling is set to be released in February of 2019, and Ken Lay is dead. He died of a heart attack at the time between the verdict and the sentencing in 2006. He was 64 years old. There were several other people involved in the scandal, many of which walked away with millions of dollars and sold their stock right before the massive drop. This scandal, along with others like it at the time, promoted a new set of accounting rules that dramatically changed the accounting industry because it clearly wasn't functioning perfectly. Now auditors have much stricter independence rules. Also, the CEO and the CFO have to certify the financial statements so they can't later on deny that they ever saw them, which happened with Enron. On the date I left, I absolutely unequivocally thought the company was in good shape. Again, this was just a brief review of the scandal. Some of the things I didn't cover include intentionally causing power outages in California, Ken Lay's ties to former President George W. Bush, Enron's involvement with the election of former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, how everything was ultimately revealed, and much more detail about the individuals responsible and how much they profited from the whole scandal. If you want to hear more about any of these, I recommend you watch the full-length movie I mentioned earlier. And I just want to say, it's important to remember that all the shareholders who lost money from the scandal weren't bad investors. They were victims. 
Victims of crimes committed by Enron and Arthur Anderson. The information they were using to purchase the stock was promised to be accurate, when in reality it was far from it. At the time, Enron's bankruptcy was the largest bankruptcy ever to occur in American history, which makes this one of the biggest scandals in American history. Now that it's over 15 years old, we can all look back at it at a safe distance as one of the most interesting scandals in American history. Let me know in the comments any thoughts you have on Enron, Arthur Anderson, or anything... So it's a pretty good discussion of the fraud that existed there for probably an example that many of you aren't aware of. Then in chapter 8, um, really what we're getting here then is a, a way to think about how crises, especially in this era, have quickly become global crises. And while it's easy for a country to think that it's someone else's fault that they caused the crisis, uh, and everyone, uh, well I misspelled this word here too, um, that um, th th there are some examples where the crisis is really unique to the country, but for the most part, um, countries uh, crises do really go from one country to the next. And this is largely because the asset markets are all collected together. Um, so the final video I then have for this lecture that gives us a pretty good overview, again, of chapters 5 through 8, would be let's talk then about how we get a global financial crisis now that we have an understanding of the patterns that exist within a crisis itself. Are we heading towards a global recession? Whoa, that looks scary. Like an outlandish suggestion. Banks aren't in trouble. Unemployment in many Western countries is at record lows. Yet investors in government debt, known as bonds, seem to be sending a warning signal nonetheless. Today... And this is absolutely true, right? So this, uh, this is not from that long ago. Um, global debt levels by governments is reaching an unsustainable rate. And that's basically what we're going to see here over the next nine minutes. Market interest rates on 30-year U.S. debt dipped below 2% for the first time on record, an indication of pretty profound market pessimism about the growth prospects of the world's largest economy. And this week, the two-year market borrowing rate for both the U.S. and the U.K., fell below the respective 10-year rates for the first time since the financial crisis a decade ago. That's called our, uh, the inversion of the yield curve. Go. That's unusual. The financial equivalent of water running uphill. Oh. The gap between the two interest rates falling to below zero has consistently foreshadowed U.S. recessions in the past. I think we're right to take the bond market signals seriously. Certainly in the past, we've seen similar bond market movements in the lead up to a recession. And it is important to look out for these signs to give businesses and consumers as much time to prepare. We are concerned by the global outlook at the moment. I think if I had to put a number on it, I would say that the chances of a global recession in 2020 are perhaps one in three. So what's the problem? Well, though headline U.S. growth seems to be holding up so far, Donald Trump is plainly upsetting global investors and businesses. This shows how measures of trade policy uncertainty have been driven up sharply by the president's trade hostilities towards China. The same is true for economic policy uncertainty. The number of factors that are driving this economic fragility, one, of course, is, is, is the escalation in, in, in the trade disputes between the United States and other countries. The second, of course, is Brexit. Uh, the third is the political dynamics in Europe, most particularly, uh, more specifically in Italy. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the auto sector, which is hurting uh, Germany. They've all been contributing uh, to what is generally a fragile uh, economic recovery. Outside the U.S., the picture is clearly weak. China's economy is growing at its slowest rate in 30 years. Growth in Europe has also been softening. The German economy contracted in the second quarter. The continent's export powerhouse hit by those global trade tensions. What does it all mean for the U.K.? Well, GDP here also fell in the second quarter, dragged down partly by Brexit uncertainty. It's really not going to take very much from on the global arena to push the UK into a into a mild or even a severe recession. I think the chances of the UK entering a recession are higher than 50% at some point in the in the So that's pretty significant, right? 
the basically what we're saying here is that many of the world's large economies, other than the U.S., are largely thought to be entering a recession in 2020 or 2021, and that those can potentially then drag down the United States as well. Coming quarters, and I certainly think it'll be hard to say what share of that will be down to Brexit and what share will be down to global factors, but it, it does seem like a sort of perfect storm brewing. And if things do go south, what tools are available to policymakers to fight another coordinated global downturn? Well, they could turn on the spending taps to support demand and probably would do, given abating concerns about government debt levels. But interest rates in many countries around the world are still at rock bottom or close to it. Could we see coordinated monetary and fiscal policy between states of the sort we saw a decade ago? Well, you'd have to be pretty optimistic to bank on that, given rising nationalism and fraying multilateralism. It certainly seems that there is limited scope for cooperation, and in fact, some of the downside risks that are making a recession more likely is that lack of cooperation and that uh, sort of me-first mentality. So, will me-first mean the interests of the global economy coming last? Ben Chu there. Now, earlier I spoke to Professor Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize-winning economist, and began by asking him whether he thought the global economy was indeed entering recession. Well, a recession is usually defined as two quarters of negative returns, and the global economy doesn't go into recession. It goes into a slowdown, and we are on the verge of a, a significant global slowdown. Which countries do you think will be the most and least affected by that? Well, Germany is already uh, poised to go into recession, and that will weaken all of Europe. The United States is not likely to go into recession, but the promises that Trump made uh, will clearly open. He talked about growth of four or five percent. After the sugar high of his tax cut, we had 3.1 percent. We're already down to 2.1 percent. Uh, and then, of course, China's slowdown is pivotal in the slowdown of the global economy. To what extent do you think the current uncertainty in the global economy is down to the White House, the, the policies of the man in the White House? Very much so. Uh, the protectionism, uh, the trade war, Dude, where is this guy? I mean, I've met Joe Stiglitz once before. It looks like he's in a hotel room, I'm guessing. Um, uh, yeah. Um, fun fact about Joe Stiglitz. Uh, every time he writes a book, he dedicates it to his current life, his current wife, and he says, with love forever, um, but he's been married four times. Um, so this is classic... Um, thing that he should probably just stop dedicating books that way. ...are clearly having global repercussions, but there's a broader uh, problem. He's trying to re redefine geopolitics in a chaotic way, problems in uh, India, Kashmir, uh, in Iran, uh, are all related to the uh, instability of... A Trump's foreign policy. Uh, you've talked about the world going into a slowdown, uh, particularly countries like Germany. What do you think it means for the UK? Well, uh, we live in an interconnected world where uh, a slowdown in any country, a uh, significant country, has global repercussions. Uh, Britain's not insignificant, and the uncertainties associated with Brexit clearly are contributing already to weaknesses in the UK, and that will also have repercussions, especially for you, but then eventually for the whole world. How do you think this is going to make itself felt to, to, to the average person, the average worker, taxpayer, whatever, in, in the UK or Germany or the US? I think you're going to see unemployment going up. You're going to see real wages stagnate, maybe even going down. We're going to be, uh, enter a period of, of uncertainty, maybe not as bad as what we faced at the time of the global economic uh, crisis of 2008, but uh, it will be the first major downturn since then. 
What do you think governments realistically can do to um, ameliorate it or even prevent it from, from gaining strength? There is a need for more stimulus. Uh, the U.S. economy has uh, uh, a weakness that's fundamental, and it's related to its inequality. Uh, if the U.S. addressed its inequality, uh, uh, redistributing income from the top to the uh, middle and the bottom, it would s support more aggregate demand, and that would lower uh, our unemployment rate and would restore growth. Now, that's a bit of a controversial statement. That's not, I would uh, venture to say that not all economists ag agree with that or believe that. Um, uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, this is a Nobel this is an economist who has a Nobel Prize, so he's obviously a very talented and gifted economist, but um, not all economists agree with what he's saying there. I don't see that happening, though, unless we have uh, uh, an outcome in the 2020, November 2020 election that uh, replaces uh, Trump. It sounds like uh, what you're in favor of is a great big stimulus globally and what i would actually be in favor of this is the time for countries like the united states and germany that have underinvested in infrastructure to make those infrastructure investments uh you know if you can borrow it close to zero or maybe Ooh, who's that coughing in uh someone in his hotel room even a negative interest rate that's the time to make, this is the time to make those investments. You get more growth today and you provide the foundations for more growth in the, in the future. Right now, the world is facing uh, a, a crisis, uh, a, a climate crisis. Uh, it's uh, an existential threat for all of us. We need to spend enormous amounts of money to retrofit our economy to meet this challenge. Thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what's so funny there, but something was. Uh, maybe all the coughing. Okay, so that gives you uh, basically, uh, again, you're reading Chapter 5 to 8 on your own, and after either before you've read that or after you've read that, um, you'll have watched this video. And again, I'm just trying to give you some kind of highlights of these chapters and provide a little bit more perspective um, of what's going on. And um, you'll notice at least with chapter eight, there's this kind of long list, especially on like page 163 of all these crises that have happened worldwide. It depends on where your interests are if you want to read it in that great of detail. But um, just get the idea that um, financial crises are not generally local, they are generally globally speaking. Okay, so that gives you an overview um, of chapters um, 5 through 8, um, and um, I hope that kind of helps you understand the material um, a little bit better.